All right, so welcome back to the Jason and Peely Project. Super excited for today's guest, Lin Ying Zhou. Hey, Lin Ying, how you doing? Good, how are you doing, Jason? I'm doing awesome, and I'm excited to talk to you today. You are in Boston, so you're another northeast, Northeastern person here on the radar where most people are calling in from uh, one of the sunnier states that um, it usually has a different perspective. So I appreciate this. And uh, Lin Ying is a founder and CIO of Acris Capital, and her mission is to help people achieve freedom, breaking free from the constant constraints of money, time, and unfilling jobs. And we, of course, love that narrative. Um, you were in New York City for a long time, and we were as well. Actually, Peely and I met there. And so after immigrating to the U.S. at the age of 10, she defied the odds and succeeded as a tra trader in the male-dominated world of Wall Street. Uh, building a partner track career in investment management, she realized she was unfulfilled with life, quit, and traveled the world. The freedom that fueled by passive income she generated with her small multifamily apartment building and condo in Boston, she realized if she could turn this into a side hustle, into a real business, that she could be free to travel, spend time with family, and live life to the fullest. Now, that sounds like an awesome life to, to most people, and especially people that, that check in and, and really listen to the show. How did you take that first step to start down that journey? Yeah, it's it's not an easy step. I think most people know, you know, having a job, it's you know, it's something that you know, something that you're very comfortable with, right? You know, having a salary, bring home a salary, bring a W two, and it's easy to kind of settle into that track on a day to day basis where you know you don't have to take risk. You can go to the, go to work, you know, do your nine to five, and then come home, and then you know figure out what you're doing with the family, the kids, and then time flies by, and before know it, you're you know near retirement age. <laughs> so it's definitely not. Um, it definitely wasn't an easy step, but you know what I was at the time was that I was very, very unhappy at my last job. Um, you know, I was making good money, but there wasn't, for one, there wasn't much purpose in the job. You know, I was making money for wealthy institutions, and you know, I was trading fixed income at the time, and you know, there wasn't, you know, rates have been very low for a few years. So it's not like I was making them a lot of money. I was more doing principal preservation than anything else. Um, and then the other thing is that I really, really struggled for control. Um, the company were going in a direction where, you know, I wasn't happy with, um, but I had no control because I was just one of the employees. I was just cocking the wheel. So in terms of culture and time and just lack of flexibility, that was what really pushed me to kind of take the leap of faith and go into entrepreneurship. Yeah, I love that. And you spoke about just settling, right? And I find that so many people, even if they're unhappy because they're, they're familiar with that, that they'll choose the unhappiness because the risk of potential happiness because they've never felt it before, it's just so out, outside the box, right? So they get stopped at that point. So talk to us about that moment when you said, I'm done, I'm leaving. Where, where did your mind go that next day when you, you were on a whole different track? It certainly wasn't, you know, one day I was doing my job and the next day I'm like, all right, I, I'm, I'm done, I'm out. You know, it, it was, it's never gotten to that point. It's always the slow build up over time, right? Over about a year or so, um, you know, I was like most people that I was unhappy, but I wasn't willing to take the leap because I wasn't sure what I was going to do. Um, they really, you know, I've done fixed income trading at that time all my life. And then all of a sudden you're asking me, okay, now you don't want to do this anymore, or do you want to do this at a different job? Like what are other possibilities out there? I didn't know. So it took a lot of exploration in that sense to, to kind of figure out um, at that time, you know, whether or not what, where I was going was the right path. And, and I didn't figure it out at the time. You know, I, you know, our, my, when I was working at my last company, our first endeavor was into cannabis. So, you know, I, uh, well, my coworkers and I basically got together and we decided, okay, you know, cannabis was becoming recreational legal in Massachusetts. You know, maybe we can kind of take our expertise in debt financing and basically create, you know, fill the gap in, in that because, you know, cannabis ventures can't really get funding from the bank. So maybe we can provide funding there. Um, so our first endeavor was that, and obviously that didn't go anywhere. So, and then eventually they moved into real estate. So it's never a, you know, like you pull, you pull the switch and then it, it's, it's done, right? It's always a gradual transition. 
yeah, I think people always look for that. Like, what is that key like that, that unlocks my future when it's really that we took action and that action enabled us to learn those next steps of the results we want. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You have to take it one step at a time. You just got to move forward. I think that's the important part. You can just take that initial step and move forward and get out that, you know, if you're unhappy with your job, to get out that unhappiness and explore other opportunities. That's the most important part. And eventually you'll get there. And so you tracked in the syndication. Talk to us about the first experience there. Where, where did you hone in and said, this is the right fit for us? So when we got started in real estate initially, our, our entire focus was generating passive income for the partners. So there are three of us, uh, myself, Christine, and Charlie uh, at, at Acris. And we actually got started in small multifamily. Um, so what we did for our first project, which, which actually Charlie is writing an article about, um, is a you know a, a five unit that we bought from a wholesaler that we sell off finance and we fixed and flipped one of the units and then kept the other four, you know, bird that, and then now we sell it. and then we sold it. We just recently I sold it last month. So there's a whole, you know, if there's a whole story around that strategy and, and what came out of it that we learned quite a bit from our first project at Agris. Um, and then we eventually accumulated another seven units and eleven units and then we found syndication. Um, we actually went to the well let's not gloss over that that's what, okay. what was the through line because a lot of people will take that step right so what's that lesson you learned through that that really was the carry through to the next project it, it's a variety of lessons i mean that project itself was so complicated and so many strategies were involved in that i mean the first lesson that we learned was that you don't want to buy houses built in the 1900s um, because they're a slew of hidden issues that you you'll find through the through the course of owning that project. Uh, anything from you know the storage line being connected to the city wanting you to put a new water main down. Um, that means having to excavate excavate the entire you know basically entire block uh, that would cost us like a hundred thousand um, dollars. And we we got you know we got out of it from doing that, but you know, there was a lot of lessons and politics that went into that building. And yeah, so lesson number one, um, don't buy anything in the 1900s. Uh, lesson number two, um, seller financing is actually an awesome, awesome way to finance your first deal. Uh, it requires very little money down. So if you can like, you know, if you go to a wholesaler and there's an option, definitely just propose that if they, it's not on the table yet and just explore the opportunity. Um, and then, you know, there is a comments of scale um, that we learned that, you know, that we eventually brought to syndication is that in the small buildings, the, the operating expenses are a lot higher, you know, the contracting work I mean, comes at a higher cost and there's, uh, there's less efficiencies there. So, you know, that's why we kind of started looking for bigger and bigger buildings that way we can bring that economies of scale to, to our operations. Yeah, I love that. Many times people get so excited about the deal, they miss something that that ultimately may hurt them, right? So your, your talk track about an older building and then the city wanted you to really update to today's codes or today's standards or today's whatever, that, that, that happens in a lot of places. And so when you buy these buildings that there was no codes when they were built, you know, and, and right. now they're just being put together and now you're trying to update that. You, you don't usually you're so excited about the deal that you'll jump that step. So you know, giving the investors that that or people listening that idea, I mean, someone will just get saved probably tens of thousands of dollars by walking away from something. Because even as simple as if you're doing other buildings and you're built, I don't know, before 1970 or they have aluminum wiring and you're going to do an agency loan. There's all these little things that you don't want to learn the hard way because you maybe don't allocate for your budget when the lender pushes you to do something or mm -hmm. or, or the city pushes you to do something. So you move from, from those projects into the uh, large syndication. Um, are you still doing this um, around uh, Boston area or, or now where are you doing your syndications? Actually, uh, all of our deals, so I, I live in Boston and my business partners are in Boulder, but because both our cities are so expensive to buy in, in terms of cash flow, uh, we actually buy long distance. So our first few projects were in Spokane, Washington, and then you know we partner with other operators on syndication deals in in Dallas and Orlando. Awesome. So that, that's interesting, Spokane, Washington, because it's usually, I guess, for Boulder, it makes sense, right? Because for me, I'd be like, no way. Because even though you can remote invest, you know, we're in the Midwest, we're in other spots. 
it's still that distance. If I want to jump on a plane to see the asset, you know, that, that that's, that's a journey to get there. So um, very interesting. And um, what stood out about Spokane, Washington? What, what really signified this as a market to look at? When we first started, we wanted to find a market that we're familiar in, but makes uh, sense from a cash flow perspective. And, you know, a couple of other things that we looked at is really whether or not the city is benefiting from a, you know, the immigration trend uh, in terms of population and jobs. So the reason for Sobokan is primarily because, well, one, it does meet a lot of criteria in terms of, you know, job growth and population growth. But at the same time, uh, Charlie, one of my business partners actually grew up there. So there's actually family. Uh, we have family there so there's there's uh, your boots on the ground and relationships that we can build based off that um so that's our initial investment but then you know now we're actually transitioning out of Spokane uh we're now our focus is now more in the greater Phoenix area in Arizona awesome beautiful another high growth market right there so and you're absolutely right like someone who's boots in the ground my sister is in one of the cities and she's not looking at it from a real estate component but she can give me the underlying factors about what's happening in the city right so this is an area where i, I don't know the path of progress there they're open up a brewery they have this new destination happening or those are points that really help you for your talk tracks you can understand the way the industry is going how has your 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 trader background what, what do you feel has been some of the massive strengths you've been able to coordinate from that into what you're doing today um, so as a trader, you know, the, the primary job responsibilities were deal finding, uh, underwriting, and negotiations. So this, the, this, those, those things sound very familiar to your real estate yeah. as well, right? Yeah. Um, so essentially you're looking, you know, I think a lot of my skill set is very transferable because you're essentially looking for a different asset class, right? Instead of fixed income corporate bonds, now I'm looking for real estate. So there's still the broker communications that, you know, I have on a pretty much like a weekly daily basis. Um, the underwriting, the, the, the analysis that goes into, uh, into figuring out whether or not the deal makes sense, right? The, having the right assumptions, the exit model, the sensitivity analysis. Those are all things that, you know, that I did at my previous shop for corporate bonds, but now I'm just transferring that into real estate assets. And then obviously the negotiation aspect too, um, you know, what, what are some tactics to be negotiating? How do you get the best deals? Um, so yeah, I, I think, you know, part of the reasons why I moved from, you know, fixing income to real estate uh, in the first place is because my skills are so transferable. What are some of your favorite negotiation tactics to use on larger multifamily? <laughs> uh, it's uh, it's it's definitely very different. I mean, there's a you know there's the anchoring you know there's the anchoring aspect, um, and the other one is that explain, when I make offers, what that is for someone who doesn't know the term. So so basically, you know, you want to make sure that you don't either anchor too high or too low when you start the negotiation process. Um, because when you do, uh, I mean, there's always on a larger deal, there's a whisper, right? But um, but you have to kind of make sure, you know, how do you frame the other party's mindset around what your offer is? Um, and then the other one is that when I make offers, I never make offers in round prices. So there's always an odd, you know, trailer. So that, you know, it shows, you know, I put work into this number. I'm not just calling out 10 million, 15 million, 15 and a half, you know, that they actually put effort into it so that the broker can take you seriously. I actually ended an offer in $849 um, a, couple, a couple weeks ago. And the, the dude like, cents. <laughs> he, like, did not want to like present. I was like, present this offer. <laughs> so, but it got us like, we were like, we were back and forth. It got us to where we want. It was yeah. like, I, I was at the end and I was like, okay, Here's my offer, da 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 da, eight forty nine. He was like, "What is the eight forty nine? I was like, "It works for me, man." You know, yes. <laughs> but it's yeah. So it does work, right? Because I think we get so we get so over. You know, we, we get blasted with like that, like the car sale, like nineteen ninety nine, or you know, mm -hmm. like twenty thousand or twenty five thousand, and it becomes easy to say, "Well, I'll just knock a hundred k off," or or you know, right. this or that, because it's they don't seem like real numbers after a while, right? If you're looking at it, so. Uh, that's yes. awesome. Now, moving moving with that and moving your direction to Phoenix, um, super high growth market, right? And it, it still feels like um, almost the wild west. How, how is your strategy for, for finding properties there? Are you looking for, um, we'll say, aggressive rent growth possibility plays? Or are you looking for you know high value add plays? Or what, what kind of potential opportunities you're looking for there? 
So our core strategy revolves around a class B value add. Um, so it could be a class C plus that we can bring to a B. Um, there are a couple of things that we look for. Um, you know, in terms of our, given the current market right now, right, our rent growth assumptions are not very high. We're being very conservative um, in the current environment, at least for the first year or two, so that, you know, if something, if there's more uncertainty down the road, we can, we can kind of have a great cushion against that. Um, the other, the other thing is that we, we look for value at property, and like you said, Great Phoenix area is actually a really, really strong growth uh, area, and there's been a lot of indicators in the space that they've gone through the business plan. Um, and they've, you know, executed and they upgraded like a majority of units and now they're selling it and turning it around. Um, you know, what we really want is, you know, something that really hasn't gone through a lot of that. Uh, because then we can add value at the same time, kind of leave the meat on the bone for the next buyer. Uh, yeah. Just make it more enticing for the next buyer. Um, so for, yeah, for Great Phoenix, it's, it's very competitive right now out there. Um, there are a lot of syndicators in this space, there are a lot of real estate investors in this space, but sometimes it's just, I think you just gotta do work. You just gotta, you know, do the underwriting, make the offers and and one day you'll get a deal, but it's definitely not easy, but it's not easy anywhere, really. It, it, <laughs> in the US, in the real estate right now, it's, it's competitive in every market, so. Well, where, where you stand out, I mean, you said two things there, right? You, you're thinking about your end buyer in mind. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes I'll ask like, who who is the buyer for this? And so oh, we'll, we'll, we'll figure it out. Well, right. that, that's not a strategy, especially when you're raising capital, right? But also that you, you consistently do the work and that mm -hmm. will lead you to the opportunity and where 80% of other people will fall off is that you'll try and then when it doesn't hit right away, right? It's that game here. And, um, you know, I was talking to an investor and started doing, you know, investing back in 1995 and just, you know, there's no rush to it because these are long plays, right? right. Where um, sometimes, you know, some markets are more transactional, but you're, you're into this, even if it's three to five years, it's still not a house flip where you're, you're really just turning your product. So, you know, yeah. love your story, love what you're doing. Um, how can people find out more about you, find out more about the company, connect with you and see about future projects? Yeah, um, we actually put out a lot of educational content and we have a monthly less newsletter that goes out uh, to all of our investors. And so I really encourage any investors that are interested in investing with us to, you know, sign up for our newsletter through our website at www.accuracycapital.com. And then uh, we also have, you know, we also onboard investors ahead of time so they see the deals right away. Um, so I definitely encourage filling out the investor application on our website as well um, if you're interested. Um, but yeah, definitely feel free to reach out to any of us through the, through our emails. I, I think I have, my emails is l z l u at backwardscapital.com. And we, you know, for our investors, we try we try to be a resource for them too. Like we we realize, you know, in the current deal flow environment, we might not have a deal, you know, that's going to come out for a few months. But then if they're seeing another deal for another operator or another syndicator, and they really need advice or need to know what questions to ask. You know, we always welcome to bring it to us and we can look at it and, you know, help you uh, kind of go through that process as well. That's an amazing resource. Lenyon, thank you so much for coming on the show. Really awesome. Really great points. Love what you're doing. Appreciate having you. Great. Thanks for having me, Jason. Thank you. And for everyone listening, thank you so much. Talk to you shortly. Join us for your second cup of coffee every Monday through Friday at noon. Live every day, bringing us our best content we've done so far. Super excited, super engaging, bunch of great guests. We're here to answer your questions and we so appreciate you listening. Make sure to check us out. Can't wait to see you.